You do know you're on a split screen, right? No. <laughs> hmm. I'm just going to twiddle my chair a little bit. <sighs> so, good morning. I'm not sure we're live yet. We'll be live any minute now, I think. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, everybody. It is... What is it? Saturday, September the 16th. How could it possibly be September, you ask yourself? October. I've been asking myself all week long. September, September. No, wait, wait, isn't it? Wait, wait, no, 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 no. It's October. How could it possibly be? You see, now I'm a month ahead. How could it possibly be October? October, October the 16th, everybody. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> I think I must be losing it. Or simply just not wanting to have time go so fast. You know, when you are young, I think time goes sort of, you know, slowly. And then when you sort of grow up and you, you know, you, you've got the j jobs and or even university and jobs and then the family and on and on it goes time goes really really fast but as you get older i heard from many old people i've heard um that as when you get older time goes really really slowly so i'm going to take from that that i can't be older yet because <laughs> time keeps whizzing past for me maybe it's just that i'm just really really busy so all right so before we begin uh, I'd like to say good morning to my spirit guide, Grey Eagle, who, as always, is standing to my right side. Yay! And I'd like to say good morning, Chris. How are you doing, Chris? Good morning, Rosemary. Good morning, everyone. I'm doing great. <laughs> Did you like how I sort of gave us a month for a second? Just... Well, you know what it is? It's I'm feeding you too much information just before we go on. I'm going to have to stop that and put you in a whirlwind. I know. I know. You know what she'll, she'll say? And I thought we can do this. And then I thought we'd do that. And then and my mind is going whirring 19 to the dozen with all of these amazing ideas that Chris has had. Should we share that one idea with them about meeting people for dinner, Chris? What do you think? Absolutely. So when Chris, the next time Chris comes down to Florida, what we're going to do is, are you ready, everybody? What we're going to do is, we're going to tell you once, maybe once a month or something, we're going to tell you we're going to be at this restaurant at this time. And if you like, you could join us. That doesn't mean we're paying for your dinner, just, just to be clear. If you want to join us, you're paying for your own dinner. You could even pay for my dinner or Chris's dinner. <laughs> but anyway, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be letting you know at least once a month where we're going to be and you can... If you'd like to, you can join us and without any invitation whatsoever, you can just turn up. How does that sound? Uh, and then there are other things that she uh, kept talking about. Anyway, let's move on and let's focus, can we, on today? Because, <coughs> excuse me, we're still in October, right? We're still in October. We're still celebrating all sorts of things, fall foliage, um, we're celebrating all those fabulous apple pies and apple crumbles, which are my very favorite. Uh, we're celebrating, what else are we celebrating? Oh yes, we're celebrating Halloween. And as most of you will know, yes, on the 29th of October, let me get the month right, on the 29th of October, we are having a webinar open to anybody and everybody. We've made it as affordable as we possibly can because at first, we were just going to say, hey, we'll be here at this time and we're going to tell stories. But when we realized how we're going to have to do it and the, and the you know, the different things, we, it's going to cost us money to do it. So we're making a small fee for all of you. If you want to know more about it, go to my website where there it will be. And all you have to do is click on that little button to buy a ticket. The tickets are very, very reasonable because it's as we're going to have a spooky Halloween night, Friday the 29th. I know we should have had this on the 31st, but I think Chris is busy on the 31st. So, and, and so the 29th, Friday the 29th from 7 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time, which is New York time. 
uh, which is the witching hour in England, 12 p.m., uh, the witching hour. So we're expecting and hoping that people will come along and uh, we'll all get together. We'll sit by uh, the fire, or if you don't have a fire, it doesn't matter. We'll be sit sitting by something. Bring your own spirits with you. <laughs> that can be brandy, vodka, or even a fabulous spooky story that you would like to share with us. The only thing that you have to understand is that if you are going to tell us a spooky story, if you want to join in and tell us a spooky story or share a spooky story with us, it has to be a true spooky story. So, uh, so you know, so you, you need to pay attention to that. But I have a few up my sleeve. Let me see. I've been writing them down. I'm going to... Oh, yes. Uh, mm. We thought we'd have some sort of spooky scary and then not so scary but spooky nevertheless. So there was a time when, um, yes, there was a time when I had a serial killer actually in my bedroom. We might tell that story. It's a good story. It's a very scary story. It's really one of the few times as an adult that I've been scared by what you might call ghosts. Let's call it a ghost. Let's call him a ghost. We're going to tell that story. Um, we're also going to be, I'm going to be telling you the story of the old man in the cottage. And some of you may have read about that story, but trust me, even if the story is in the book, there's so much more to tell about that story that isn't in any of the books, that those little added details. Uh, what else are we going to tell? We're going to tell Hmm. We're going to tell a weird and very strange story, which I may tell on the night or I may tell it uh, maybe even next Saturday. I'm not going to tell it this Saturday, but maybe next Saturday about my encounter with witches. This is where you'll start to think, has she lost it? I know she couldn't remember that it was October. She thought it was September, but has she lost it? Are you kidding? Really? Witches? Anyway, so we're going to be telling all sorts of sort of weird and wonderful and spooky and sometimes scary and sometimes not so scary stories throughout the month. But specifically on the 29th, being Halloween, the Friday before Halloween, we're going to be talking a little bit about Halloween, how it began. We already know because we've talked about this before that the the, the Brits, the Britons, uh, the, um, the Celtic uh, uh, races the the cornish people don't say in england i have to tell you not many people think of the cornish as being celtic but boy oh boy the cornish have these wonderful stories that they tell and of course they have pixies and they have leprechauns and they have all sorts of other things going on there yes i know some of you thought it was only in ireland that they did that but no in in, in uh, in uh, Cornwall, they have these things also. And then, of course, we have the Welsh, who were very, 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 very psychic. Uh, being part Welsh and part Scots, I've got that a double whammy in that Celtic area. And, um, the, you know, Halloween was when the people used to, to in however long ago it was, uh, they used to light bonfires and they would wear these amazing costumes to scare away the ghosts because they were trying to keep the ghosts at bay and um, that's how our Halloween uh, began and of course now it's becoming this enormous uh, amazing and, and very fun filled uh, celebration that we have so uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about that as well so this we're all about the spooky stuff but before I get forget the apple picking and the haymaking and the scarecrows and and the pumpkins and the carved pumpkins because that's what we're into when we're talking about october as well um tomorrow morning if i forget to tell you any other time tomorrow morning will be my cooking show at 11 a.m same time as we are now same time same place and um uh, I'm going to be cooking as I promised because we've had lots of requests. How can I make sure I make Yorkshire puddings and what are they anywhere uh, anyway? And how can I make sure that I make them and they're nice and fluffy and they don't go flat and horrid? Uh, so I've got a no fail. You wait and see. It'll probably fail because I've been boasting about this no fail recipe. It's never failed me before. 
keeping my fingers crossed it's not going to fail me tomorrow morning I'm going to show you how to make the best Yorkshire pudding ever so you'll never fail again at making your Yorkshire puddings and and because it is October and because it's the apple picking season um, I'm going to show you how to make baked apples as well so we've got sort of Yorkshire puddings uh, I might also make some um, uh, make like a meat sauce or something that we can spoon into the Yorkshire puddings because that's what my grandson loves to do he likes to spoon sort of like a ground meat mixture into the Yorkshire puddings and sort of eat it like it's a like Yorkshire pudding is a pocket that he can eat from uh, so so we'll have a, so we'll have um, you know a dessert we'll have a main course under dessert going on uh, so if you want the recipe uh, I did send the recipe to Chris I also sent a list of the tools that you'll need however I did make a slight mistake <laughs> Uh, I did say for the baked apples a baking pan but I actually meant a baking dish a shallow but nevertheless a dish with a lip otherwise you're going to get juice all over your oven so a shallow dish to put your apples in and I'll show you how to make those tomorrow I have to say it's one of my most favorite ways of eating apples uh, now where are we yes story time Yes, here we are, and it's story time. Now, some of you may have heard this story before, but it is, for me, it was a little bit spooky, and I'll explain to you why. So, let's begin. Once upon a time, when I was a very, very young, in fact, from the time that I can remember, my mother would threaten me that I would end up in the towers like my grandmother my grandma Eliza, who I never met, she died when I was four days old. Um, now the towers, and if you can look it up, you can Google it actually, the towers is this enormous, enormous sort of mansion type place, lots of chimneys, uh, so you know, th that's why it was called the towers, because there were lots of these huge chimneys and sort of towers and different things, right in the heart of the city of Leicester, if you want to know how, if you look up Leicester, you'll never find it if you spell it the way it sounds. L-E-I-C-E-S-T-E-R. Yes, it's a weird thing. L-E-I-C-E-S-T-E-R. -E -E Leicester, it looks like. But anyway, it's the city of Leicester. And the towers sits right in the heart of the city. And it was the, the uh, psychiatric hospital um, that my grandmother was a voluntary patient in as far as I'm aware she was a voluntary patient I'm not sure if she was ever pushed into it unwillingly but she, every time she heard voices every time she sort of had these things going on in her head she would they would become so strong uh, and so powerful that she'd become so afraid that she'd march herself into the hospital and have treatment uh, and in those days the treatment was not at all pleasant the treatment often consisted of uh, you know electro you know electrical shocks and all that sort of thing so the treatment in those days we're going back to whenever it was the early turn of the century maybe uh, 1900s uh, and um, remember we're talking about my grandmother who was who's my daughter's great grandmother so we're going back a few years and um, my grandmother used to hear voices and as I was growing up my mother would see in me the same traits as she recognized in her own mother and uh, she would often as a child even threaten me if you're not careful you'll end up in the towers like your grandma and this was something that was said to me on a very very regular basis very regular basis now even though <laughs> I didn't know what the towers was. I had no clue what the towers was. <laughs> it still scared the pants off me because the way my mother said it was a definite threat. If you're if you're not careful, if you don't behave, you're going to end up like your grandmother in the towers. And she never explained. My mother never explained to me what she meant other than watch it or that's where we're sending you. So, so um, anyway. So as I grew older, of course, I realised that my grand mother everybody thought my grandmother Eliza was crazy because she heard voices and my mother believed that I was crazy too so 
imagine now I'm, let me see, I'm thinking 15 years old or something like that. Yes, I'm about 15 years old. Having grown up with the threat of the towers all of my life, and uh, we had um, a, a fantastic arts program at my school uh, and a great gr drama and arts program, which I loved and was very involved in. And um, one day our teacher, you know, chose a, a group of us, took a group of us to one side and said to us, you know, we're going to go and uh, perform at this particular place where I want you to go and we go and we'd had been rehearsing this particular play and, and we had gone and performed at different theatres and different schools for different people so it was perfectly a normal thing for us to do so she said we're going to go and perform at this at this hospital so nothing unusual there until the day that we were going and we all gathered uh, we, we got a coach we were all gathered outside the coach and as we climbed onto the coach, our teacher, and there were two or three teachers with us, our one of our teachers explained to us that the, the place that we were going to was a hospital, uh, that, they, that there were patients there who had, you know, suffered with a variety of different mental issues. Some were depressed, some were, you know, maybe... Then they explained uh, and... As I'm listening to what she's saying to me, just prior to her saying the name of the hospital, I remember this dreaded feeling creeping over me, literally taking over my body. I was so terrified when she said, and we, so we're now going to go to the towers. My mother's prediction coming true you'll end up in the towers all the way on the bus i was terrified i i was a quiet child anyway didn't say too much to anybody so nobody took any notice of the fact that i sat there quietly by myself absolutely petrified <laughs> about what was going on and finally we arrived at these huge wrought iron gates and we the bus drove down a long driveway and at some point the house this this built this building came into view with and it it was just the perfect place to film a horror movie because you could imagine at night time i mean even during the daytime it was the spookiest weirdest most terrifying place you've ever seen i mean and if you know the towers if you've ever been to the towers if you've if you feel inclined to go and take a look at it, please, by all means, go take a look. You'll understand exactly what I mean. So we get there, and uh, and I'm very quiet. We do our performance. We do the play. And then we're instructed by our teachers that some of the patients uh, wanted to make tea for us. And so we would have tea and sandwiches. And our job as, as students was to take care of the patients. So we had to go and ask a patient, would you like a cup of tea? Would you like a sandwich? What can we do to help you? That was our job. And, and to basically entertain these uh, people who were, who were patients in the towers, which may well have been, and I knew very well, may well have been the place that I would end up as a patient at some point in my future. So I don't know if I'm sort of giving you the atmosphere here or giving you the feeling I'm not sure if I'm able to convey to you how terrified I actually was and how awful it was. And the patients were lovely. Uh, there was one woman who was continually crying and she would come and hold your hands and she would cry and cry and you tried to go to her or you'd say, would you like a sandwich? We were only 14 and 15 years old, you know, we weren't necessarily you know, quite tuned into what it was that we were supposed to be doing. But the room that we had our tea and sandwiches, uh, it was a very long room. It was probably uh, in its heyday in uh, this building, it was probably uh, an enormous ballroom or used as an enormous ballroom. And we were just at one end of the room. 
and the room just went on and on and on all the way down stretched way way down uh you know it was a, it was a huge huge room but we congregated at this top end of the room and as we were there and dealing with the patients and it, it was very sad and um the you know it was uh, it was difficult not to have sympathy or even to have empathy with these with these lovely people who obviously were suffering uh, in various stages of suffering with certain breakdowns mental emotional breakdowns and um but remember they were the best of the of the patients who were in uh in this in this hospital um and um at some point i happened to look down the length of the room and way 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 down at the bottom of the room and it was a long way down way way down at the bottom of the room in the middle of the room sort of way down at the bottom uh, there was a figure <coughs> a woman <coughs> excuse me a woman sitting in a hard back straight hard back chair with her back to everyone and uh, so I pointed her out to my friends and our job we'd been made clear our job was to make sure that everyone had tea and sandwiches so we were discussing you know like who, who's going to go and give her some sandwiches and nobody wanted to go and i said i'll go and i felt very strongly that it should be me who went because uh perhaps even then i knew that i would perhaps be a little bit more empathetic plus i had this very very strong connection to the towers my grandmother had been in here remember my grandmother had been in there as a patient even though i didn't know her i connected with her because my mother had made it clear i was just like her and i would end up there one day and all i could see was this small figure way down at the far end of the room so i took my self with trepidation I have to tell you, heart pounding in my chest. The closer I got, the more afraid I became. Not sure what I was afraid of. Maybe I was afraid of seeing me in 10 years time or 20 years time. Maybe I was afraid of, of uh, you know, sort of coming, coming face to face with what I might end up like. I'm not really sure. But as I got closer and closer, the more uh, I felt uh, absolutely terrified and as i came up to her i noticed she was wearing a navy blue dress with little tiny white flowers and she had the strangest haircut her hair was sort of black with very very gray streaks through it and it looked as if someone literally had put a pudding basin on her head and cut around the pudding basin so she had this very odd uh, haircut but the thing that was the oddest about her was in her right hand she held a cigarette but she was so still and not moving and like a statue that the cigarette had burned all the way down till it was there was only a little bit left in her fingers just a little stub left in her fingers and the rest was ash and there was this long long stream of ash that was that was the shape of the cigarette she she held so still like a statue that the ash had not dropped from the cigarette and i know it's perhaps unbelievable but and i thought it was unbelievable and i was sort of fascinated by this ash that was intact and sort of at the end of this cigarette and it was a really long quite a long piece of ash so i stood in front of her heart pounding and i i said to her, hello um can i can i get you anything not a blink not a twitch not a movement nothing so i waited a moment or two and then i said can, can i can i help you with anything can i get you a cup of tea 
and all the while I'm looking at her and I'm asking, can I help you? Can I get you some tea? Can I get you a sandwich? At all that time, I'm totally relating to her in that um, she was, had I not noticed her, she would have been unnoticeable. I could relate to that. Had I not gone to talk to her, no one else would have talked to her. She would have been left alone because she was seen as strange. She was seen as weird. And believe you me, she, she was strange. She was weird in her own way. So I tried again for a third time. And, you know, can I get you a cup of tea? Or would you like a sandwich? Now, remember, I'm 15 years old, you know, I'm, I'm, no experience of these things whatsoever and um, as I said this to her and again she didn't blink she didn't move she didn't respond or react in any way shape or form um, I felt someone come up behind me and I turned it it wasn't one of the nurses and she placed her hand on my shoulder and it you know it's odd because there's so many years ago and it's still, I still feel emotional when I, when I remember what she said to me. And I still connect with this. And she said, the nurse said to me, it's all right, dear. She's not at home today. And what could I say to that? Sometimes we're not at home. Uh, sometimes we don't see and we don't hear. Sometimes we're somewhere else. When she said that to me, when the nurse said that to me, it's all right, dear, come away, she's not at home today. Um, we had no choice, I had no choice, but to leave this woman and walk back up to the, to the other girls and to the group of patients. And of course, all my friends wanted to know, oh, what was it like, what happened? But, but I was so moved and so in pain for the pain of this woman, how how can somebody shut themselves away to the point of being able to hold that cigarette so still that the ash still remained? Not one drop of ash fell from that cigarette. Not one movement from that woman. Not one acknowledgement or little piece of recognition. She's not at home today. Very sad very very sad many many years later <clears throat> when i talked to people and learned you know that i could see and hear those in the spirit world you know i realized that um, sometimes they must feel the same way they are trapped behind that wall so to speak i have to tell you there is no wall but you know what i mean they're trapped behind the wall or the curtain or whatever it is that our loved ones in the spirit world are supposed to be trapped behind. They're not trapped, but it's us, you know, and they must look at us sometimes and, you know, try and get our attention or knock on the window, so to speak, or make a noise or rattle or sort of, hey, hey, you know, I'm here, I'm here. And they must look at us sometimes and they must feel so sad, so heartbroken that we're not at home today. Part of what we do and part of what we're doing with our uh, story time and part of what we're doing with our, with, with our celebrating Halloween and, and connecting and accepting that, you know, our loved ones are there, they're at home to us whenever we are ready to visit them. Um, part of that is to make, uh, to make us aware, to help us to become more and more aware that if we do want to connect with our loved ones in the spirit world we have to be at home for them we have to be ready to receive them um you know years years and years ago in victorian times and before then also uh, when people would call on the wealthy um the butler would answer the door and if uh, madam inside had said I'm not receiving, uh, not receiving anyone. I'm going to take a lie down or I don't let anyone, no, we don't want any visitors today, Jeeves. Uh, then the butler would say, 
that he would he would literally say to the callers i'm afraid madam isn't home today um and we know those times don't we when we don't feel like visitors and we go oh, gosh look who's coming if we could hide we would and sometimes we do hide and we can and we're not at home to anybody but i think it's important for us to be very aware that if we do want to connect with our loved ones in the spirit world if we do want truly to understand how we can communicate with them we do have to be at home and ever present whenever we can I look back on that time so, so, so many years ago, I'm afraid it is such a long time ago, when I was 15 years old and walked with trepidation down that long, long, long room to face that solitary woman looking strange, appearing strange and hearing the nurse say to me, I'm afraid she's not at home today. It's all right, dear. She's not at home today. And for me, I knew right then and there, yes, the nurse said, it's all right, dear. She's not at home today. It wasn't all right. And if I could have spent the time, had a little bit more knowledge, been able to, I would have tried to break through, even if only for a moment, to let her know that somebody cared. It isn't all right for us to be not at home, is it? The end. Okay, Chris, how are we doing? Uh, I think we're all taking out our tissues right now. <laughs> um, the High Priestess says this is a good live show, and I love it. Oh, good. <laughs> Vicky says, what a profound and wonderful story, Rosemary. I have shivers in a good way. Thank you. Um, well, we've intended to give you shivers. Uh, your shivers are nothing to the shivers that I felt. Can you imagine being told as a little child, if you're not careful, you'll end up in the towers, and all of a sudden there you are, face to face with someone who your mother has told you you will turn into, you will become like that person. Terrifying, terrifying, terrifying. But you know the wonderful thing was that... Um, as terrified, as terrified as I was to go into the towers, as terrified as I was for, for many years to come about the fact that I may end up in the towers, people would see me as crazy and I would end up in the towers. In that moment when I was uh, with those patients and in that moment when I was sort of facing that woman, I, it was not me that I was thinking about. I wasn't thinking, oh God, I might end up like her one day. It wasn't that at all. You become so involved with the people there. They're lost and lonely lives. And um, there's no, this is about me. It is about them. Uh, I do hope, I don't know, because I never knew what happened to this woman. I never was able to go back. I never even knew her name. Um, but I do hope that many of those people who went into the towers were helped and uh, were were brought back home. Yes, Chris. All right, let's take some comments and questions. Are, are there any, by the way? Oh yeah, there's a lot of people on. Uh, Bren says it was a great story. Lorraine says wonderful story. You have so much strength, and you definitely are blessed. <laughs> Judith <laughs> says I'm surprised that woman hasn't visited you to thank you since her passing. Some What's part of her was aware of you. What's that? She has nothing to thank me for. There's nothing to thank. I didn't do anything. <laughs> I should be, if anything, I should be, you know, uh, thanking whoever who meant for me to have that experience. Because, boy, you know, we 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 can all be sympathetic when we when you know when we're moved or when we need to be. Sympathy is easy, but empathy is a whole different thing. It's much deeper. It goes much deeper than sympathy. It's when you can relate to a person and truly relate to a person and their loneliness and their feelings or their pain or whatever it is that they're going through. Empathy is some something that helps to join the two of you together 
And, uh, you know, I'm glad that I was given the opportunity to, uh, to sort of, let's say, how, how can I say this, to become more aware of how empathetic I could be. And uh, that was a great gift to me. So I have nothing to thank them for. Uh, sorry, they have nothing to thank me for. I have everything to, them, to thank them for. Chris. Catherine says, I agree. Empathy is everything. Yes. L Lorraine said, you have the compassion and strength to go to the woman. Yes, empathy. Uh, Linda says, I thought perhaps your grandmother would have met you there. Nope. No. In fact, I'll tell you something very strange. Uh, I've never... I've never seen a photograph of my grandmother. My mother hated her mother, despised her mother. But then my mother, I'm trying to think of, if, if, was there anybody she liked? <laughs> I can't think so. Uh, so uh, I, there was, I never ever saw a photograph of my mother's mother, ever. I don't know what she looks like. So um, if I had seen her, I wouldn't know. If she'd spoken to me, of course, and told me she was my grandmother, then of course I would know. But I've never knowingly seen or spoken to my grandmother. So Chris. since that visit, Rosemary, yeah. when you went, I mean, we all drum up things in our mind of how bad a place can be. But then you went. Was it as bad as you had imagined? Was it a relief on the other side coming out of it? Well, no, actually, <laughs> remember that, um, you know, when when I was there, you know, it was in the um, thinking in the 50s or something, late 50s or early 60s. Uh, I mean, things had improved, you know, treatment had improved tremendously. Um, they, I think they still did the electric shock treatment, but, the, but you know, conditions were better and hospitals were better and so on. But no, I mean, we saw the best of the patients and poor things were very traumatized. Many of them were very traumatized. Um, you knew that behind those closed doors where you were not allowed to go, where you were not taken, you knew that awful things were happening. You knew that people were in deep despair. You knew that there were things that, uh, you know, that some of the nurses and the and the orderlies were not necessarily sympathetic to their patients. I mean, you know, you knew that awful things happened. And of course, you know, in the in the sort of the late 1800s and early 1900s, I mean, people were locked away in these places and left and just left to to, uh, you know, to die because families refused many, many families and especially you know, families, wealthy families who could have afforded to uh, see to, you know, give them the best care of their, you know, of their loved ones, their family, uh, would often be so ashamed to have someone with mental issues, emotional issues that, uh, you know, if you lock them away, then nobody would see them and that would be that and nobody would ever know. And that happened over and over again and I'm sure that it happened in the towers uh, as it did in many other places I mean you know when you step now we're talking about you know uh, ghosts and ghouls and things that go bump in the night now the horror stories are actually that's real serious horror stories will often happen in the you know in in real life you don't have to be dead for horror to happen to you and if you think back to those times and the way that patients were treated and the you know, and the uh, and the treatments that, that they had for them were so dreadful, so awful. And, uh, you know, there are some true horror stories there. So did I get any comfort from going? No, I would, I could actually was so glad when that coach kept that gone down the driveway and took me out of there because the horrors that, you know, some happening even that day when I was there and many that happened uh, you know, over the previous years, uh, were just horrible, just awful. The you know the 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 horrors in that place were too many. You couldn't just walk away or be feel relieved. I did feel relieved that I was out of it, and um, uh, it did make me actually. In fact, if it could have made me any more 
paranoid about ending up there. It did make me slightly more paranoid having been there and just seeing the patients who were in uh, the best of the patients that they we were told, you know, the, the more those who had uh, who were sort of getting better were still in a, t a terrible, terrible way. So no relief there. Chris. Bren says, I'm excited about the witch stories. What are your thoughts on Bigfoot and things like that? Are those spirits or from this earth? Oh, I think there are so many things that happen that we, you know, there are so many creatures on this earth that, that we, you know, that we don't see. I mean, uh, were there dragons in ancient times? Are there dragons now? I do not I'm not going to dispute any of it because I think this earth of ours, never mind the universe, this earth of ours holds many, many incredible things that we haven't even begun to discover. Um, do fairies really exist? Well, I believe in fairies. I believe in elves. I believe in gnomes and stuff like that. Uh, I've told many stories to my daughter. My daughter actually saw a fairy with when she was with my father the very first and only time he ever visited this particular house that we were in and uh my daughter was with him i think she was about i don't know four or five years old she saw a fairy she actually captured the fairy in her hands and came running up to show me but when she opened her hands she looked at me i've caught a fairy i've caught a fairy she opened her hands it had disappeared I believe in magic is what I believe in. Chris. Mark says, when I retire, I'm going to spend the last two weeks of October in Salem, Massachusetts. Oh, right. I'm from the Springfield, Massachusetts area. And so I'll fly home on my broomstick and enjoy the festivities. As a <laughs> child, I passed out in the witch museum. Everyone thought I was on display and my peers realized it was me and thought I was put under a spell. True story. Well, Mark, thanks for sharing that one. Um, oh, do, 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 do. <laughs> we're getting closer and closer to our uh, Friday night where we're going to be telling us lots of stories and sharing lots of stories. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, uh, I think we all have a story. I'm sure we all do. So please share your stories with us. Don't be afraid. You can email us, Chris, K-R-I-S, at rosemaryaltair.com. Share your story. And uh, you can email that story. Please, please, please make it a short, you know, be concise. We don't want all of the details of how you got there. We don't want all of the details about what happened afterwards unless... They relate directly to the story. We don't want the details of who went with you and how many there were <laughs> and, and uh, why you were there in the first place. If you can make it as concise as possible, because the truth of the matter is, if you send an email that is too long and it goes on and on, I personally won't read them because I don't have the time. And Chris will actually should go so far and then scan quickly to see if we can find... But, you know, what are we supposed to be reading here? So please be, it's not that we don't want to hear from you, we do, but can you be as concise and as clear as you possibly can about what it is that you want from us? And if you're sharing a story, make it, you know, make it good by making it short. The short stories are often the best. Chris. Carolyn says, life seems to put things in front of our eyes to learn from. Yes. Do we accept these as gifts? Well, I don't know about you, my darling, but, uh, and sometimes, you know, life puts things in front of us and we don't like them or we don't want them. Sometimes the best gifts are the worst gifts we're ever going to get. Uh, you know, uh, I've told this story many times uh, about the old lady who came to us and said, if I could give you a gift for Christmas, I would give you the gift of tears. I would give you the gift of heartache and I would give you the gift of pain. Well, who wants those as gifts? Thank you very much. No, thank you. Except that it is through these things that we do learn and we do grow. So they are, as much as we don't want them, that unwanted gift, it is a gift because it really does help us and it see it helps us to see, you know, 
the greater picture, let's put it that way. Chris. <clears throat> Meg says, wonderful story. Thank you. I've always been drawn to people not at home, hoping to <laughs> give them comfort and perhaps make them feel better. How can we, quote, be home for our loved ones in the spirit world? I am always looking for signs from them. And are those things actually communication from them or just coincidence? No, I think that the spirit world do send us many, many signs. And they do try, you know, sort of like knocking at the window or trying to nudge us or trying to help us to pay attention. And I think the way that we can be at home for them uh, as much as possible is to always be open to the fact that they are around us. Always be open to the fact that when we're doing something, even if it's cooking in the kitchen, I mean, tomorrow I'm going to be cooking in the kitchen. I would be very surprised if my daddy didn't turn up. The last time we did cooking in the kitchen, my brother turned up. That was that was huge for me because I hadn't seen him for ages. And um, we need to just be very open and very aware that our loved ones can turn up, whatever we're doing. And if we, even if we don't see them or even if we don't feel them, you know, if you just want to talk to them and say, hi, how are you? And I hope you're here. I hope you're watching me do this or... Could lead, I could use a little bit of help here. Um, I always, you know, when I'm cooking things that I don't necessarily eat personally, but I'm cooking for other people, um, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll say to Grey Eagle, did I put enough salt in that? Or uh, do I need to do something else with this? Do I need to cook it a bit longer or what have you? Uh, and my daddy joins in sometimes as well and says, you know, needs a bit more flavor in there put a bit more salt in but our loved ones in the spirit world can enjoy everything that we're doing and that might be one of the reasons why i you know people think that i'm a good cook because my food always tastes as if uh, there's been a little bit of magic thrown in there and i just said to you i believe in magic well my magic is gray eagle saying uh, uh, oh, no, 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 take it out now, take it out right now, or no, you need to, need, need to leave it in for five more minutes. But being open is being open to your thoughts, your senses. You might not be able to hear somebody say you need more salt in that, but if you are open and aware, you might have this sense or this knowing sense that you didn't quite put enough seasoning in or it needs another five minutes in the oven. You've just got to have that knowing sense. And the more open you are to that and the more you talk to those in the spirit world, even if they don't respond to you or don't seem to respond to you, listen to your intuition. Listen to your feelings. Listen to that sense of knowing that we all have. So that that's what you have to do to be open and to be at home. Chris. Mark has a question for Gray Eagle. Okay. Do our loved ones in the spirit world rest? We as humans need sleep to revitalize our body when we, our bodies bit when we pass. And I know there are no days of the week, et cetera, but do our loved ones literally rest? Um, so, some do, some don't. It's like, it's like any of us. Some, some of us need more rest. We need more sleep. Some of us need, some of us get energy from doing things and, uh, you know, but the etheric body is not the same as the physical body. So it doesn't necessarily need physical rest, but certainly emotional and, uh, you know, spiritual uh, rest and attunement and times for meditating, that sort of thing. So, so yes and no, there you are. That'll have to do. Chris. Judith wants to know if you told your mother that you had been to the towers. I don't recall, but it's likely not. I was so terrified about going that it would have been something, you know, as, as a child and growing up and even into my, you know, twenties and uh, early thirties, I I was very reluctant to share uh, anything that I thought or felt because I was so busy in those times trying to look normal and trying to be normal, especially as a 
got into my teenage years. I wanted to be like everybody else. Doesn't everybody want to be like everybody else? So you didn't share. And mine was not a family that you went home and told things to. You, things happened at school. Uh, you might have gotten a, a, a prize or you might have gotten a, a, some sort of an accolade or somebody might have been bullying you. Never came home and told anything. Nobody, nobody, could, nobody could care what happened. You just, you went to school, things happened at school, you did what you did, and you came home. And, um, you know, and my, you know, my mother, I don't ever recall her ever, ever saying to me, did you have a good day at school? Just, who cared? You know, it just wasn't something she asked about. You were at school and she was, she was at work and she was doing her thing and you, you know, it was never any, any, you didn't share anything. I remember when I was, again, I was 15 and um, I hated needlework hated it with a vengeance uh but i that we got to the our sort of the last year at school and um and the teacher said okay this year you can make anything you want and finally i thought oh <laughs> oh uh what do i want to do and i so we went through all of the design books and and i chose a uh, a suit with a, a pencil skirt and a a jacket with reveres and long sleeves and I can't remember if it was double breasted I can't remember but anyway and uh, and I took it to her and uh, and I said can I make this and she looked at me and she laughed she said you couldn't even make even make a needle case Rosemary what makes you think you can make that and I said, but that's what I want to make and she promised us at the end of the year that we would be able to model what we made not that that enticed me necessarily but I wanted I've always at any time I've cooked anything or any time I've made anything I've always wanted to stretch and do the thing that I've never done before and so I must have had to get the money from my parents to buy the material but um, I remember going to the market by myself with the pattern uh, certain that never showed my mother what I was going to make, never talked about it at home. We did all of it at school. Nobody ever knew what I was making or what I was doing. I mean, you didn't just didn't share those things. It was just, and I actually ended up making that uh, skirt and jacket. My teacher was, um, she was so impressed because truthfully, I couldn't even finish my needle case. And uh, we did have a fashion show, and I did model that uh, that suit that I made, and it was a beige thing. And my sister-in-law gave me a, a green and cream-coloured polka dot scarf that I tucked into the into the collar of it. And uh, yeah, I remember that very, very plainly, very clearly. But no, we did not have that kind of family that shared in anything. Chris, all right, Linda says. Oh, hold one second. It just scrolled down. Linda says, my dad passed at a place called Pilgrim's State in New York, a psychiatric hospital. Unfortunately, I never got there to see him, but I did hear bad things about that place. So sad. I'm so sorry that that happened to you. And, uh, you know, obviously you related to my story very much and we, we do know, we all know, don't we, that uh, people who were considered to, to be, let's say, crazy, and I was definitely considered to be one of those, um, you know, we know how, how awful, how badly they were treated, and even today we hear awful stories sometimes. So I would, you know, if, if you have a relative or someone who is in that kind of a place, you need to be very vigilant and to make sure that things are happening that are good things uh not you know you've got to be really vigilant about these things uh but it's very hard isn't it so i'm so sorry that that you know happened to you and happened to your daddy um but i'm sure he's good now and let me just also say to everybody you know uh yeah, i've always been considered by many people to be crazy or something just a downright liar, <laughs> whatever it is. Just let me say that a little bit of crazy 
is it's not a bad thing you know it's fun to be a little bit crazy chris jeff says i appreciate your story today and the love you've shown to so many in spite of your upbringing well actually thank you jeff and how are you and when are you coming to florida and all of that stuff and how is andrea just sending lots of love to you guys um it actually you say despite my upbringing i actually think that it was because of not despite my upbringing i think it was because of my upbringing i absolutely one thousand percent know what it is like to grow up and to be not loved to be disparaged to be made fun of to be made to feel less than and because of that not despite it but because of those things and because those things happen to me and i think many of you listening will say the same if you've had similar similar things happen to you uh, it teaches us that we you know it, it doesn't knock the sensitivity out of us it actually uh, helps it to grow and become more so i think so i think the problem is that so many people are afraid of their sensitivity they see it as a bad thing and boy oh boy i mean okay can you relate to this i know many of you can when somebody points the finger and they say the problem with you or the trouble with you well you know what's wrong with you you're too sensitive <laughs> it's seen as a bad thing my husband said it to me my parents said it to me my family said it to me you know what your problem is you're too sensitive yeah well no you can't be too sensitive you can be ultra sensitive wonderfully sensitive beautifully sensitive it makes you a nicer and a more loving and a more giving person the more sensitive you are the nicer a person you are so don't ever any of you listening be afraid that you are too sensitive because i don't believe there is such a thing it's only those insensitive cruel mean horrible people who say those things and we don't take any notice of them and we love them anyway don't we chris so rosemary we're right at time i wanted uh just to remind people that 11 a.m tomorrow on the same channel they're currently on you'll Yorkshire be on Monday. with your <laughs> rosemary in the kitchen and then Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, we've got the bottom brick exercise at 5 oh, yeah. p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yes, and you'll be able to see that live. But if you can't manage to see it at 5 a.m. or because you're in an office or because you're working or whatever it is, uh, you can definitely then access it through YouTube. But we have our wonderful volunteer. I promise I'm going to be very gentle with you, very loving with you. I promise you I'll hold your hand. But we're going to take this lovely volunteer through our bottom brick exercise and see if we can help her to come to an understanding or realization or some sort of inspiration as to what she needs to do to be the person that we know that she can be. Uh, she's another one of our bottom brickers. If you want to be a bottom bricker, email us and let us know. Uh, if you would like to email us, if you want to know more about what, do, what we're doing, you can do this. You can either go to our website, rosemaryaltea.com, or one word, or you can uh, email us, chris, K-R-I-S, at rosemaryaltea.com, and Chris will do her very best to answer anything you like. So uh, please head to, head to the website, why don't you? There's all sorts of things, and you can see, actually, there are some bottom brick exercises that you can actually see there are some little clips and little movies and things like that going on there there's all sorts of information uh, right on our website so all right so <laughs> in the meantime we shall be back on thursday morning with our usual uh, everything uh, th sorry well th sorry the spirit world sees all that's on thursday morning oh my gosh we will be here tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, cooking up a storm uh, with my baked apples. And if you want the recipe and you want to cook along with me, uh, you can just go to my website and um, uh, you'll see all the ingredients and the tools you need. You do not need a baking tray to cook your apples on. You need a baking dish, a shallow baking dish to cook them on. Uh, sorry, I made that mistake. And then... Um, 
uh, we should be doing from time to time, we should be doing our, uh, um, uh, you know, off the cuff stuff. We'll be popping in and out for that. Uh, I'm looking forward to Wednesday. Thursday, we'll be doing our The Spirit World Sees All. And next Saturday, we'll be back again with another story. And it might be another sort of little bit of a spooky sort of whatever it sort of story it is. That an inspirational one, we hope, for you all next Saturday. If you want to know more about our webinar or to join in with us on Friday the 29th of October, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, go to the website. It will give you a little button to press. If you want our newsletter, uh, go to the website, click on subscribe. It won't cost you anything and we will not inundate you with emails. I promise you, if you only get two or three a month, that's all you'll get. Uh, but the the uh, newsletter will tell you all about what we're up to, what we're doing, what we're planning, and so on uh, for the next uh, the coming up the coming weeks. Okay, that's it for now. I'm done. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you everybody for joining us. A special thanks to my spirit guide, Grey Eagle, uh, who's just smiling away here, having fun with me. Uh, and um, until I see you again, whenever that is, please, everybody, have a very, very blessed rest of the day and a very blessed weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.